I think we all know that uh, ducks are important, but there's been plenty of research to help us quantify just how important um, documentation is for software and developers. Um, so for example, in for Tideless 2019 survey, 72% of the developers that they talked to said that uh, an open source project having established policies and documentation was a key factor in whether or not they chose to use it. And GitHub back in 2017, they've always been a little bit ahead of the curve on this stuff, 93% of their surveyed developers said that outdated documentation was a big problem in open source. I don't think that that has changed very much since 2017. And lack of documentation was the top reason that developers surveyed by DigitalOcean in 2018 gave for deciding not to use an open source project. So it's, it's, it's a key factor in developer decision making. Um, whether you have documentation at all, whether your documentation is up to date, and whether they understand the documentation whether it's clear, those are the factors that help people decide whether or not to use your open source project. Um, and when I tell people that I work on helping to make documentation better in open source, they're like, great, we need better docs. And then I have like ask the uncomfortable question, which is what have you been doing to help your projects have better documentation? Because in open source, just like everyone can contribute to open source, in open source documentation is everyone's responsibility. You can't just say, oh, it'll take care of itself. And so sometimes people think, oh, I would have to be an amazing expert in order to work on the documentation. I would have to know everything, have done everything, like be, you know, whatever the superhero ninja rock star imaginary person that you imagine needs to, you need to be to work on the docs. But I don't think that's true. In fact, I know that's not true. Um, so first of all, it turns out that ignorance is incredibly valuable. I, I know this sounds like a joke, but it's true. You will never know less than you know today. And one of the problems in writing documentation is that once you understand something, it can be very difficult to put yourself into the mindset of somebody who doesn't understand that thing. Like you can only learn it for the first time once. So having that beginner's mindset is actually a precious resource. You should not waste it. And one of the ways that you can turn your ignorance into something of value is to create friction logs. We were just talking about friction logs. Um, so first of all, to create a friction log, first just find something you'd like to try. You, know, you do not have to be an expert. And then you follow the instructions that are there. And then you write everything down. And here are the kinds of things that you should write down. What did you try? What did you expect? What happened? Like, did good things happen? It worked, yay. Did bad things happen? It was broken, you got a terrifying error message. Write both of those things down. And then talk about what you tried next. So for example, whenever I get a terrifying error message, I just straight up, you know, use my employer's search engine to figure out like what I should do next. Um, you can use the search engine of your choice, obviously. And um, then I write down, okay, well, I looked for this error message and then I found this web page and I copy down the URL of that web page because someday in the future I'm going to want to know where I went to find that problem. And then you keep going either until you get the thing done or things get too broken to go further. You know, you search for the error message and you get like one weird spam page and nothing else. And then you wrap your ignorance up very nicely in a bow and you send it to somebody who will care. And so sometimes that's opening an issue in a project to say, hey, I tried this thing. Here's what I got. It doesn't work. Or if there's a contact information on the docs, you can send it to those people. But it is really something that's incredibly valuable as a docs writer to get a specific list of where things didn't work. Because oftentimes, if, if you're working on something, maybe your development environment is set up perfectly to do the thing but someone else's may not be, and you won't know until you see where those, theirs goes horribly wrong. Um, another thing that you can do as someone who is not a superhero ninja rockstar expert is to look at the closed issues of a project 
where the answer to the problem was missing from the docs and had to be pulled out of somebody's head, you know, probably the maintainers or someone who's had a lot of experience with the project. And by matching the solutions that are given in the closed issues to gaps in the documentation and filling them, you can help a lot of users. So here's how you play match the issue to the docs. Check out the closed issues. Look for solutions that aren't reflected in the docs. Actually on GitHub, if you looked at the, look at the closed issues, you could actually search for issues that are closed and have the word docs in them. So if there's like 10,000 closed issues in the project, you don't have to read them all. And then, depending on how the project handles updates to their docs, send a pull request. Say, hey, I noticed in issue 147 that this was mentioned as something that wasn't reflected in the docs, so I've put that in. Another thing that you can do um, with your valuable ignorance and your free time is um, replicate bugs. So lots of projects in their issues, again, they have um, closed issues that are closed, not because they've been solved, but because nobody took the time to say, hey, is this still a bug? Or somebody said, hey, this is broken, and they didn't tell you how it was broken. So just by checking to see if things are in fact broken and writing down, usually in the form of a friction log, where the broken parts are and adding steps to the issue, you can, you can do a lot of good. And sometimes people don't think about issues as being part of the documentation of a project, but issues are definitely things that devs look at to see like, oh, what kind of problems um, does this project have and are they problems I can live with? Like sometimes I, I look at, um, I, I mostly code in like the JavaScript ecosystem. So there's a module for everything in JavaScript. Like there are at least six NPM modules to like help you translate things into Pig Latin. I'm not joking. And so sometimes I'll look at the issues in a particular module that I want to use. And if all the issues are people who are still running on like node eight complaining that stuff is broken, then I'm like, okay, well, I'm not running node eight. This is fine by me. Um, the, I once heard somebody describe the process of, of choosing like your significant other, the person you want to spend your life with is when you look at someone and you say, these are the problems I want to have because nothing's free from problems. You just have to decide what problems you can live with. What problems do you actually want to have? So developers look at issues to say, hey, with this tool, are these problems the things that I can live with? And by helping to um, replicate bugs, you help other people with their decision making. And it's a form of documentation. Um, so here's how you do it. Check out projects issues, especially those that are waiting for a response from the submitter. Like look at the oldest issues. Are there issues just languishing there because somebody raised an issue and then never came back? I always worry about what happened to those people. Like, I hope it's just that they found something else to use and it's not that they got hit by a bus, but I do tend to worry. And then what was the problem? Was it actually stated clearly? Can you replicate it? Can you document it like with a friction log? And if you can replicate the bug, add your new info to the issue. And then this is the kind of thing that can like really suck up a lot of your time. So if you wanna try this, Time box yourself. I like, if I do this, I, I never want to spend more than an hour trying to replicate something before I move on. And um, it can be hard to like, if you're the kind of person who loves to solve puzzles and, and you really like to know the answer, it can be hard to limit yourself, but definitely set a timer and and because you don't want to lose your whole life. Um, I also want to encourage people to write tutorials and not all tutorials have to be fancy. I think that some of the most useful tutorials are the most basic. And I think that you never really know anything until you can explain it to somebody else. Um, I, I like to call myself a, a, a community taught developer because even though I had um, in my lifetime three actual like computer science classes, most of what I've learned has come from other people's documentation. And when you're very, very new, sometimes the hardest things to learn are the things that everybody already knows. Um, I answer a lot of customer support email for my side project. And I find that a lot of the early um, questions we got for our API was, where do we put our API key? because the developers who've created the first version of our API, they knew where to put the key. They used the key all day long. 
but they didn't put it in the docs. And so if you can write a tutorial about something very, very basic, um, it may not seem like fancy, but you will help a lot of people. Um, so I think the best way to pick what to write a tutorial about is to think of the last thing that you learned that you got excited about. Um, if you have a long suffering significant other that you run to when you learn like, oh, look at this cool new thing, and they like nod, think about writing that down in a tutorial. How would you explain it to somebody else? And if you kept a friction log, that is a really good jumping off point for a tutorial. And then the most important thing is the why. Why would somebody want to do this thing? Why did you learn this thing? Um, and then a great way to uh, feel more confident in your tutorials is to make it a team activity. Pair up with somebody else. You both write tutorials for different things, and then you test them for each other. Um, and if you can't think of anything else to do uh, when you're casting about for, for documentation, uh, for ways to help with documentation, and this is not usually a problem. I feel like there's usually so much more documentation work in the world than could like ever um, <laughs> could, could ever leave people bored and looking around for something new to do. But copying is a great, uh, is a great way to uh, both increase your own like portfolio of docs work and also to help out projects. So take a look at a project that you really like, see what kinds of docs they have that you think are useful and see if those docs are missing from another project that you really like. So what makes those docs good? And what can you copy over in terms of the structure, in terms of like the introductory material that would help the second project get that same kind of documentation? Um, it's 100% okay to look at other projects docs as a model for your own doc. Just think of them as like coloring books. The headings and the outline are what you're going to color in with your own um, text and information. So to follow a template, pick a project that you like, make a list of what kinds of docs it has. Does it have a readme and your project doesn't, quick starts, tutorials, concept documentation. I think outside the box of developer-focused documentation. Does that project have really good governance docs or really good community docs? Look for a list of document templates. Uh, Lisa and I are both working with a good docs project that is working to make some of these good document templates. Um, there's also Write the Docs. Um, they have a really wonderful Slack where you can ask for help on all sorts of topics um, or choose a project with more comprehensive docs to find your models. And then use that template, use that model as a coloring book to fill in with your own text. Um, now, I know I, uh, I've given you a lot of things that you could possibly do in your copious free time. Um, but this is kind of the bonus round. Um, this is from a wonderful series of comics by Julia Evans. Uh, she's Bork on Twitter. If you don't know her work, you're really in for a treat. I, I highly recommend following her. Um, but one way that you can add a lot of value to documentation is by writing a concept stock. Um, I don't know if you've ever found a library or, your, or a project where you look at it and you're like, I don't even know what this is about. I don't even know why I would need this. I think that's a good place to investigate and, and think about, okay, what are the concepts underlying this library? What would somebody have to know in order to like even make a start? Um, but that does take a lot more time and work and kind of dedication to learning, um, which is why I've kind of, thought of this as a, as a bonus documentation round. Um, so find a project where it's unclear to you why you would use it and make a list of the concepts involved. And then you can write a one sentence explanation of each concept. This is really hard. And then are there other concepts involved in those explanations? Are you going to have to unpack? Is it going to be like inception? You're just going to keep going layer by layer? Probably yes. And then repeat until you're done. And then write a story about the use case for the project, including your explanations where needed. Um, for example, I've been off and on trying to help a project uh, that's a 
<laughs> I am still still very far away from writing the concept doc for this project, but it uses something called a directed acyclic graph. And that's about as far as I've gotten. But what it does is it makes it very easy to do quick searches of kind of complicated structures. So, but until you actually have that problem, you do not know that a directed acyclic graph is one of the possible solutions. So having a story up at the front that says, hey, does this sound like you? Do you have a lot of multi-featured data where it's very hard to search through it quickly? Well, you might want to use a directed acyclic graph. So um, this is definitely something for the highly motivated. But everybody is a beginner at something. If you've been holding back from contributing to docs, there's no better time to start than today. And so there's another thing that I wanted to mention. So some of the pushback I get from people who are like, oh, I want to contribute to docs, but I just don't think that I'm a good writer. And I understand that totally, especially if you're moving from doing mostly code development and you're starting to work in doc development. It can be scary to start doing things that you don't know whether or not you'll be good at, especially if the language of the documentation is not your first language. But Unless you are the Beethoven of software development, I feel like you've probably been expressing yourself in writing at least as long or longer than you've been writing code. And my side project that I mentioned briefly before is in my non-Google time, I run an extremely large online English dictionary with an API called WordNIC. And I used to run dictionaries for Oxford University Press. So I feel like I could say with a measure of professional confidence, that if your English skills are sufficient enough to understand me giving this talk, you can certainly write documentation. You might want a little extra help from your friends um, to help you with mechanical issues like punctuation or, you know, did you spell something correctly? But uh, if you have the technical know-how to make a stab at the documentation and you can understand enough English to listen to me now, you 100% your English is good enough to write documentation. Uh, I also run the Semicolon Appreciation Society. So if you just need a little bit of extra like authoritative appeal, maybe that works for you more than dictionary work. But in my professional language person opinion, you are gonna be fine. Use templates, ask trusted friends to help you review your writing, to give things a quick proofread. And most of all, accept corrections gracefully and with thanks, if you do just that last thing, then you're probably like miles ahead of most people um, who are native speakers. Um, most people, if you do all that, they'll overlook a couple of misspellings or sentences that are having, you know, disagreements with their verbs and they'll look at the content of what you've created. Um, so uh, Lisa was talking to me about um, the docs clinics that SALT is working on. And I think that sometimes people actually need help in figuring out how to ask for help. And, um, and I think that's, that's just human nature, right? It's, it's hard to ask for help sometimes and it's hard to prioritize what kind of help you need. I don't know if you've ever had a lot of relatives over to have a big holiday meal and you know everybody wants to make the hors d'oeuvres and nobody wants to do the dishes. So asking for the kind of help that you really want will go a long way towards getting it. So when you've written some documentation or you've worked on some documentation, think about what do you really want help with? Do you want surface cleaning, right? Do you want people to help you check your spelling or look at your commas or make sure your sentences and your verbs are living happily together? Um, or are there missing words? Maybe you write very quickly and you tend to elide words. It happens a lot. Or do you really want help with the, with the deep stuff? Do you want people to tell you, hey, this argument flows really well. I understood where I was at every step. Or, oh, did you notice that at the end of section two, you say, don't forget to do this thing, and that really should have belong, that really should belong at the beginning of section one. Are you using the right vocabulary that's used in your community? Is, are things gonna be clear? And, is the documentation focused enough that someone reading it knows why they are there and what they want to do? And so some of the questions you should ask is, hey, is it clear to you who this documentation is for? 
Is it clear what the reader should do or should want to do? And what might be missing? And uh, if you're new to getting help on your docs, uh, I think, and the person who's helping you is an old hand, ask them, hey, what are the kinds of things that you usually tell people about their docs that maybe I haven't asked for? Or what are some problems that you typically see in documentation? Um, I think asking those kinds of meta questions, like what should I ask, um, will definitely help you learn how to learn. So being able to create documentation is really a superpower. It increases your impact. It increases the impact of the projects you contribute to. And it's an incredibly effective way to be part of a larger community because everybody needs and wants docs. Um, if you have questions, I'm here for some time to add, answer questions to the best of my ability. And I want to give you some link slides in case you missed some of the things I talked about. One of my coworkers at Google has a really good blog post about uh, friction logging. It's a little bit more in the context of um, product review than it is uh, open source project review, but I think it's still very valuable. Uh, the whole series of wizard docs from Julia Evans are just amazing. If you ever wanted to learn more about how does TCP really work or um, what's involved when you're running a Docker, they're just beautifully communicated. And, um, oh, I didn't mention Doxy. <laughs> Doxy is an open source documentation theme for the Hugo static site generator that's maintained by Google. There are a lot of projects that use Doxy, um, including Kubernetes. And uh, also the Good Docs project on GitHub. And I'm just Amy Keen on Twitter. If you see a pink robot, that is me, except no substitutes. And uh, my DMs are like in that weird quasi open stage. So you can DM me if you have docs questions, but it may take me a while to actually see it because I don't check that tab all the time. Um, anyway, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me uh, rant at you about docs today. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, yeah, does anybody have a question or something you want to ask Erin at all? I'll also check out the Twitch stream to see if anyone there has a question. While we're waiting on questions, I want to say thank you. And um, I posted this in Twitch, but I love it when the closing keynote or a keynote or kind of unknowingly reiterates what we've been <laughs> talking about through the day. Um, we had some people who were newer to tech who were asking a lot of questions and we were telling them, hey, it's okay to Google things. It's okay if you don't know everything. And just, I've had a lot of conversations today about how you don't need to be an expert to contribute to open source. So thank you for reiterating that message. That was awesome. If we waited for everyone to become an expert before contributing, eventually everybody would die out and there would be no more contributors. Exactly. So. And I say this as a gray haired person, right? Like I really want people who are new to open source to feel comfortable and encouraged to participate. All right. I also know it's the end of the day and people tend to get tired. Yes. <laughs> well, depending what time zone you're in, so. Oh yeah, that's true. I am very Pacific time centric. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming, everybody. This has been a good day. We got, um, throughout the day, we've had probably 25 or 30 people in and out across our various channels. Um, I know we saw some, you know, somebody do a walkthrough of how to do documentation today. We've had some good conversations, shared some good resources. If you are interested in continuing your documentation journey, we do have a documentation working group that meets every other Thursday on Twitch. Um, I meet at 12 p.m. Mountain, 6 p.m. UTC. And um, you can find information about when to meet with them on the SALT Community Events calendar. Awesome. Thank you all so much for having me here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Erin. Uh, all right. Round of applause for our speaker and for all of you who attended and contributed today. <laughs> Even though those are all silly on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, everybody stay in touch via Twitch, Slack, Twitter, and we will see you all later. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.
Thanks so much for everything, Cassandra. I hope you have a wonderful evening enjoying soccer and everything. So. Yeah, I'm muted. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No worry. All right. Yep. See you later. All right. Bye.